Hello, everyone. Um, good evening, um, all, all of our participants tonight. We're glad to have you. I am Vera Perkins Hughes, the president of the African American Alumni Association of Case Western Reserve University. And it is my good pleasure to welcome you this evening. The African American Alumni Association of Case Western uh, was officially established in 2009. And our purpose is to provoke, pro provide support and networking opportunities to African American alum of CWRU. And we work to provide a forum for the university to recruit students and foster friendship among persons connected with the university. So if you haven't heard of us, talk to me or send me a chat and uh, some information and I'll get back to you. So I hope that you and your loved ones are healthy and safe. Uh, it's been a trying time in America and throughout the world and we're just glad to have all of you tonight. Before we begin our program tonight, um, I'd like to give a few quick housekeeping notes First, everyone is going to be muted by default, and we want you to please remain muted to limit background noise during the program. We know that some of you have submitted questions prior to our beginning tonight, and we hope to get to all of those questions this evening. If you should have any additional questions, please utilize the chat feature, and we will do our best to get them answered. So that you know, so that we know who you are, we welcome you to rename yourself by clicking on participants. I see it on the bottom of my screen has a couple of people uh, body shapes. So click on participants, find your own name, and then using the more option, click on more um, and then rename yourself so that we all know exactly who everyone is. And then we ask you to please turn on your video because we'd love to see your smiling faces. Um, we are still uh, living in a uh, recluse <laughs> style. So let's see your faces and um, say good evening to each one. Finally, uh, we are happy to welcome you to this installment of Profiles of Inclusive Excellence, a virtual series in collaboration with the African American Alumni Association, the Office of Inclusion, Diversity and Equal Opportunity, and the African, African and African American studies uh, to highlight the work and research of African American uh, black faculty. Again, thank you for being a part of this evening. We appreciate you. And I would now like to share a little information about this evening's featured guest, Dr. Carolyn Steele is an assistant professor at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing at Case Western Reserve University. She received her BSN in uh, 2002, her MSN in 2006 from Florida A&M University. And then she completed her PhD in 2010 and business degree in 2016 from Case Western Reserve University, making her a double alum. She is board certified as an adult geriatric primary care nurse practitioner and practices in the Cleveland Brain Health and Memory Center at University Hospitals of Cleveland. As a clinician and nurse scientist, improving cardiovascular health in minority populations has been the focus of her clinical practice and research. Dr. Steele's research expertise include hypertension clinical trials in older population, psychosocial assessment and management of chronic diseases in older adults, recruitment and retention of minorities in clinical trials. She has over 13 years experience managing, coordinating centers and conducting quality assurance monitoring for multi-site clinical trials, as well as experience in leading and conducting multidisciplinary clinical trials. And Dr. Steele's um, evolving program of research, she addresses gaps in knowledge to improve cardiovascular health in minorities by evaluating the feasibility and scalability of interventions to support and sustain self-management of cardiovascular conditions, such as 
hypertension, and stroke. She was recently awarded the NIH multiple uh, PIR01 for targeting secondary stroke risk reduction in African-American men at high risk for recurrent stroke. The body of work she has amassed nearly 2.9 million in external funding. And Dr. Steele has extensively published in the area of health disparities, minority health and hypertension clinic and outcome trials, having a significant impact on practice and policy. She has uh, received several awards for this work, including an early career award by the American Heart Association. Dr. Steele is a natural leader and has served on many regional and national advisory panels. She has held national leadership coordinating the development of data collection and data management procedures and quality assurance standards across the SPRINT, S-P-R-I-N-T, trial, as well as served as chair of the trial's project coordinator and operations committee, a member of the executive committee. Now she currently serves as a board member of the Midwestern Nursing Research Society and Cleveland Council of Black Nurses. In addition, Dr. Steele is co-chair co of the Health of Diverse Population Research Interest Group and co-chair of the Diversity Task Force. Um, so our host this evening for this uh, program will be Dr. Heather, Heather Burton. Uh, Dr. Burton is Senior Director for Faculty and Institutional uh, Diversity with Case Western Reserve University, specializing in gender and racial equity. Dr. Burton also serves as Acting Co-Director for the African American Studies Program. And now I turn the program over to uh, Dr. Heather Burton. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Vera. Thank you so much. And welcome to everyone for sharing with us this evening. Um, we are excited about our faculty profiles and we have highlighted some great faculty um, over the academic year since we began. And I think our first one, Vera and Crystal, was October. I think our first one was in October. October. And so um, we have been able to highlight uh, Black faculty on campus since October and we have our schedule plan through the next academic year. But I'm excited tonight because we have Dr. Carolyn Steele with us. Um, and, and I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Steele from a, a student recommendation. And, and it speaks volumes when students recommend faculty to you. I was looking for faculty mentors for a program that I was working with. Um, for our, our NOAA AGAT. And so I was looking for mentors in, in nursing to work with a student. And uh, one of my mentees that I work with here on campus was like, I got the perfect person for you from nursing. <laughs> and so lo and behold, that was uh, Dr. Steele. And in that, I learned so many great things um, about Dr. Steele. And I've already told her that I, I plan some additional work for her, uh, especially when we get a couple of things up and running. And, and one is because she is one of, um, one of our few black faculty on campus that is also an HBCU graduate. So an, a historically black college university graduate. And, um, and, and she understands that transition from graduates from undergrad from an HBCU to a predominantly white institution, especially when we're talking about graduate programs. But Dr. Steele, we start every interview for the Faculty Profiles of Inclusive Excellence with the same question. And that question is, I don't know if you're familiar with the movie Brown Sugar, but if you remember Tay Diggs and Sanai Lathan and the whole theme throughout that movie was, when did you fall in love with hip hop? So what we do with our Profiles of Excellence is we take that question, we ask that question as it relates to your discipline. So the question becomes, Dr. Steele, when did you fall in love with nursing? Oh gosh, such a such an early age. I would say around middle school. So um, I don't know if you know, I was born and raised in Central Florida. 
uh, to be exact, Orlando um, in a single parent home. And um, while my mother was single, we debate this to this day, she was not single. She had my great grandmother to support. So it was two women as head of the household, right? So Miss Ernestine was always present and uh, she helped raise me and my five siblings. So when I was in middle school, I would say around the seventh or eighth grade, um, my grandmother at an early age started forgetting things including taking care of herself. Uh, she had concomitant conditions such as diabetes and hypertension. And then later she developed cognitive um, decline that progressed um, fairly fast. So my mother tried to allow her to, you know, have as much independence as possible, but she was commuting back and forth from Sanford, Florida to um, Orlando, and it became like a huge burden. So my grandmother, eventually, she came to live with us, and then we were compressed into this sandwich generation where my mother uh, was responsible for her children as well as my grandmother. And then, you know, needless to say, my grandmother condition progressed and uh, oh my gosh she would wander outside at night let out the family dogs um, to she almost set our house on fire so by the time I reached the 10th grade uh, she required um, around the um, clock care and um, so um, I encountered a home health care nurse and she would come in three days a week and I was just fascinated with the care that she provided as well as the wealth of knowledge she had to share with our family and her genuine just you know um just caring nature and so all of my sisters and my mother we all had our designated roles and of course um no one wanted to give the injections the finger sticks for the gl blood glucose or uh change the feeding tube dress and so naturally i volunteer and and had a nick for it and so uh, they sparked you know, my interest into becoming a nurse. And so um, I completed my BSN and uh, master's degree at Florida A&M University. So while doing my nursing rotation, you know, we, we go through peds and, um, you know, the various specialties. And I, you know, didn't like children at that time. And so geriatric was like my niche, you know. And so um, once I, you know, went into my professional nursing career, I worked on an intensive care unit um, specifically for diabetes. Diabetes. And I went witnessed so many health disparities that really plagued communities. And, um, you know, I knew that I really wanted to focus on um, minority health, um, especially in uh, geriatric um, populations. So I, I think that's, you know, how my interest spawned into really wanting to get into geriatric care. Yeah. And, you know, that's a great story because you don't hear often and especially, you don't hear often where um, a young person has knows what they want to do at a young age, but then they follow it, and and it stays the same trajectory as they move throughout. And so, to be able to identify and know that, um, based on your grandmother, that that was what led you to nursing and the interest in geriatric care, which um, I want to I want to talk about your research. And, 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 and some of the things that you're doing around that. But first I need to ask a clarifying question that I heard in the bio. And this wasn't one of my questions, but I heard this in your bio, is that PhD in 2010, and then a business degree followed. So tell me a little bit about the business degree following the PhD in 2010. Well, you know that saying when they say you are a lifelong learner, uh, I think I was at that point where I had been, at, I literally, let me just step back and say, have been in school the bulk of my life. And so when I had that period where I graduated, although I had a, um, a great, you know, um, project to work on, I was still missing that um, 
you know, information um, gathering that I needed to try something different. But also, I think with working on research projects, you have to understand the business aspect behind it. When you have large grants, um, you have to manage budgets, you have to know where the money goes. And as a wise person told me, I don't look good in orange. So, you know, you have to know where those dollars are. So um, I, I, I figured I would go ahead and um, step into the business side to understand um, the health the healthcare aspects of it. That makes all the sense in the world. And I don't know who your wise person is who told you about the orange because that is my saying all the time that I don't look good in county orange. Um, but it's and, and I was having a conversation earlier talking about you know federal dollars and how very often when you have to start doing or managing federal funds, you don't realize the stipulations. When it comes to grant management, and this is how uh, individuals end up in some trouble with grant dollars, losing jobs, or even, uh, like you said, the, the end is, is jail time. <laughs> and so that is excellent. And I think that's something that, you know, uh, it's one of those things of, of you recommending to, to, to others <laughs> with, with, the, with the business. Now, the business degree, was that a? a master's of science and healthcare management. Okay. Okay. So thank you for sharing. I heard that in the bio and I said, well, let me wait, let's clarify the business degree after the PhD, which makes sense in, in, in the lifelong learning and then understanding how to manage grants. And so speaking of grants, um, you recently received the NIH grant. Tell us a little bit about that grant and the research behind it. So um, uh, I received a $2.8 million um, grant August uh, 2019, and it's a multi-PI um, grant, and it's uh, titled Target Management Intervention Team, and it's a curricular-based um, intervention led by nurses as well as peer ed educators, and it really targets culturally tailored interventions to reduce uh, secondary risk of a stroke, and so, um, you know, we were on pause for a while because of COVID. We had literally just received the grant, and then we had to go through a lot of reiterations to um, shift to technology um, um, in the COVID environment, but we're targeting African-American men who had stroke within the last five years. And so this curriculum basi um, basically incorporates their care partner and a peer diet that has gone through the spirit. So it's like each one teach one uh, type of uh, setup where um, the groups meet um, over a series of months and just um, discuss how they've managed their stroke um, um, outcomes in terms of diabetes, uh, hypertension, high cholesterol and things of that nature. Okay. So that, um... So, so how did you get involved with wanting to study strokes and, 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 it, and then this particular population of males because um, you have other research interests as well, which I wanna talk about also, but how did you kind of veer to this direction? So um, with um, hypertension, when we know uncontrolled hypertension leads to um, numerous adverse events, including uh, stroke and when you look at stroke and the health disparities among the African-American men um, have the worst uh, health and outcomes as it relates to stroke. And so this naturally made sense to focus on this particular population. We know that uh, African-American men delay uh, health care. Um, nine out of 10, they probably have not been to a doctor within, I don't know how many years, you know, I go through that with my husband where I have to send notes to the doctor with him and, you know, and, and so it's real. And uh, African-American women, once they collectively come into these groups, um, they share their experiences and know that, you know, that they're are better ways in which they can um, manage, they, manage their health with support. And I think that's the importance of uh, these particular curriculum type interventions targeted towards um, African-American men. Um, so I know that as I should say, so what's, what's your, what, what do you find more satisfaction, pleasure in? Being a clinician or doing the research? 
Oh, I, I love both. And I think that's the beauty of the nursing profession, profession that we have so many um, um, areas that we can um, apply a niche to or just have a wealth of experience from, from the um, administration, administration teaching side to the clinician side and definitely the research side. So my, my passion initially was uh, in the, the clinical area where I got to spend one-on-one um, time with African-Americans. They saw someone that looked like them and, you know, they were hearing um, the advice that was given to them regarding their health. So in Tallahassee, when I did my um, uh, clinical rotation, it was in rural areas. And so they appreciated having um, someone to give them, um, to care for them that looked like them and um, more readily accepted the advice that was given to them. So um, I enjoy that, um, but I definitely enjoy the research side as well. The, the sprint, um, the sprint trial, the NA, NIH sprint trial, tell what, explain to those that um, may have heard that in your bio, what, what, what that entails and what is that? Uh, so the SPRINT trial is um, a landmark trial on a number of fronts, and um, basically it was designed to test whether treating um, blood, systolic blood pressure to a lower target goal would in fact reduce cardiovascular disease, and um, we enrolled, I think I said about 9,300 participants. We had um, approximately 30% African-American and 11% Hispanic. So it was a, a very diverse uh, trial. And so the outcome was basically that there was a 27% reduction in um, all-cause mortality in, um, and, and regardless of race, um, ethnicity or age, um, hypertensive um, individuals benefited from the lower um, targeted goal. And, um, and this trial was very important in terms that it um, sort of guided the um, current hypertension guidelines that were changed, in fact, to um, have blood pressure targets um, uh, recommended to the lower goal of 130 over um, 80 versus the 140 that was previously recommended. And so it, it, it changed the way in which um, providers are recommended um, um, treating blood pressure, which is more aggressively and not delaying um, treatment um, in terms of um, um, pharmacological agents. So one of the things I've noticed though, you know, Prior to that, when I was, um, you know, um, working as a clinician, is that um, individuals were not receiving the um, right recommendations in terms of being prescribed medications, and so individuals were told, "Oh, you may have prehypertension," and I think that was a category, you know, in terms of the previous guidelines: prehypertension, hypertension, stage one, stage two, and I, I used to always tell and still do tell my students that there is no halfway um, being pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. And I think we have to start considering that when we're talking to, um, you know, disadvantaged groups that are at high risk for some of these chronic conditions that, you know, treatment is the best option and not delay treating them. Um, one, we miss opportunities to get them while they're in clinic. Um, who knows when they may return or will return back to the clinic. So it's important to, you know, educate them as much as possible, but also um, treat them with the best practices that are out there and available. So, yeah. Do you think, um, I, I have, I, 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 my mind was going in two different directions, but because I wanted to go back to the, the standards of blood pressure now. You said now the new standards or the new guidelines are 140 over, just so that everyone can hear. And we know on this call that if we're not in that range, what we need to be doing to make sure that we're being taken care of also. So the new guidelines recommend um, individuals be treated to a lower blood pressure target of 130 over 80, less, less than 130 over 80. 
previously it was uh, treatment at uh, 140 over 80. And I believe prior to that, it was even as high as 150 over 90 to begin initial treatment for blood pressure. Okay, so me understanding this in my layman terms is that previously they, they would start prescribing medication, they wouldn't prescribe medication or treatment until you were at the 140 over yes, 90 correct. or the 150. That, that, you know, my blood pressure runs very low. So we have a joke in my family that if my blood pressure goes up to 120 over 60 <laughs> or over 70, that they need to rush me to the hospital immediately. But it's interesting that the treatment didn't happen until those higher numbers. Mm -hmm. um, have they noticed that there's been a decrease in terms of blood pressure numbers? Are people be more aware or is just that this is the guidelines to say, hey, this is when the treatment needs to happen because we're risking more strokes and more um, additional diseases or additional responses when we let blood pressure go this high? Um, you know, with my recent study just completed last year um, upon entry, and it focused on um, older African-Americans with um, high blood pressure. And so, um, Many of them were not prescribed the right medication or um, the number of medications to help them reduce their blood pressure. So if they had a blood pressure of 150, uh, the average person was prescribed one medication, which our previous research in Sprint showed that um, minorities, especially African-Americans, may need as many as three anti-hypertension agents in order to control their blood pressure. So it's still some disconnect. It has been some hesitancy among providers in terms of clinical inertia uh, of whether or not they will prescribe um, treatment. Change is hard for some folks and, um, and not understanding that and still sticking to the previous guideline makes it much harder to try to um, control blood pressure in certain populations. Which makes me think, and, uh, and, and I know you're aware of the disparities that exist, especially when we're talking on both sides uh, in terms of treatment and, and treating, like you said, certain populations and being aware and what needs to be put in place so that those things are changed and to treat our, um, treat certain communities, specifically African-Americans with a different mindset than what you treat the, the majority. And it, this is fascinating to me. I'm sorry, um, <laughs> listening audience, that I'm just fascinated by these numbers with blood pressure. And now the medication that it takes three pills to lower medication. And, 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 and I'll share with you, Dr. Steele, I remember being in the pharmacy. I was at, at the grocery, I mean, at the drugstore, and I was standing behind someone in line and they were filling a prescription. It was a, a, a mother and a son. And the Cashier said, uh, pharmacist cashier said, that'll be a thousand dollars. And I was like, what did you all just get? And it came out of my mouth before actually realizing these people are not with me. I don't know who they are, but I was just so dumbfounded by hearing a thousand dollars for prescription. And so I, and that was for insulin. And they had reached their, you know, um, their, their insurance had been reached to the max for that particular month. So they had to pay out of pocket. But in thinking of that, when we think about blood pressure medications, and, and if it takes three, how does that financially also impact the, um, the individual and the community when we're talking about, talking about this? Like, how does that come into consideration? So with most drugs, you have your generic and you have your brand. Um, um, uh, agents that could be prescribed. And I think this is where we have to really understand how social determinants of health play a role in um, health maintenance for certain populations and querying individuals um, about this information and not just assuming um, that they can afford what you consider the best brand is one of the things that providers have to take into account. Um, when prescribing certain agents. Um, and many of them have been around for uh, decades. And so, you know, you can get a 90 day supply for $4. Um, so it's just understanding um, the individual's circumstances 
and uh, what medications are on the formulary that um, can be prescribed uh, according and they probably and they probably need more dr Steele's in the in the room <laughs> with the patients um, that 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 understand there's a question that's coming from the chat that I want to um, ask you and it says what is the best way for communities of color to advocate for their health and the health of their loved ones um, so we're in this age of technology and we call them um, internet uh, surfers. So, you know, ask a nurse or, you know, if you have that family member that you can um, ask a question and um, based on whatever knowledge you have, don't be afraid to ask that question because what you want is a response to the question from a provider while you're you know, um, face to face with them. So one of the things we're trying to empower our research patients, um, you know, with many of the uh, national campaigns that are going on, know your numbers. What does it mean? Um, what does the top number mean? What does the bottom number mean? So that they can arm themselves with some information um, to um, ask the doctor or their provider um, what's next. But what we're finding out in the community is that a lot of individuals, um, especially minorities, have had hypertension on average of 16 years plus. They are knowledgeable. They are knowledgeable about their conditions. They are aware. But getting them to change lifestyles and health behaviors is a different, it's a different um, entity. So um, you have to work towards that. So they are knowledgeable. Yeah, I think, and, and it's interesting because I think that that is, um, that's one of the strong things that you say. And the key is that one, and, 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 and I, you know, I see desire in some people to want to change, but because they don't have the tools to, to know how to change and to really put it in play, they can. And then also by surrounding family members, <laughs> because it's also hard to create that change when you have additional people surrounding you who aren't supporting the change and making the change. Um, I've, I've watched, I, like with, with church, I, I, you know, some of our people who are diabetic and, and, and you're looking at them and I'm like, didn't you, just, didn't you just have some cake or something? Why are you eating some more? And it's just that natural behavior. And, that as, and then we know too, as a community, as a as black people, we like to eat because eating is the social gathering that brings us together for community is around food. And, you know, you think about Sunday dinners and all of that. And so, yeah, I, I can imagine that there are many people who know, but to try to change those those uh, the lifestyle and eating. I change my eating doctor still probably every other day trying to figure out. <laughs> I'm gonna do better. Um, there's another question that comes from the chat. Which comes first, diabetes, high blood pressure, stroke, or heart attack? Ah, uh, uh, do you think you're smarter than a clinician? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, vascular disease um, starts uh, early on, especially in childhood. So it just depends, you know. Um, some people have diabetes and may not have hypertension, you know, but um, it's a vascular component. So there's no specific order in which which condition will um, appear. But um, um, treading down that path where your um, vascular system is, you know, um, slowly but surely becoming blocked, something is bound to happen, whether it's a stroke or, you know, you know, diabetes or uh cardiovascular disease of that nature. So there's no specific order. Mm -hmm. It's uh, like you said, tying in. Every time I think or hear diabetes, all I think about is the, the woman in, in the drugstore and that thousand dollars and it makes me put down that extra piece of chocolate cake or every time I turn around, it's like I cannot afford to pay a thousand dollars for medication. Um, but I wanna switch gears for a minute and talk about your transition to case mm -hmm. and how did you end up choosing case western reserve for and, and 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 i have a reason for asking these questions because i i, I know some of the story and the experience of of you still being here 
And so just kind of sharing that with our listening audience. But how did you pick Case Western Reserve for your school for um, the, the nursing program for your PhD? Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, at Florida A&M has um, a partnership with Case Western Reserve University. And um, the goal of the program is to increase uh, diversity into graduate programs. And so while I was working on my master's, um, my dean at the time was friends with a Cogley here at Case Western Reserve University. And so um, she was like, do you have anybody that wants to work on a PhD? She's like, yeah, I know. And so um, this was decided before I could even give an answer. So, you know, I respect my elders. And, you know, at the time um, she, she basically said, you have no life. Uh, you're going to Cl the Cleveland, you're going to work on your PhD. And so, you know, within a two week span, that's what I did. I literally jumped up and moved to Cleveland to work on um, my PhD. So it was the network, um, of someone knowing someone in Cleveland. And uh, when I thought about it and just being so Southern, and I was like, oh, okay, Cleveland, I could drive back and forth. Um, you know, I like to hit the road and I could drive back and forth to Cleveland. So when I looked on the map, I thought they were talking about Cleveland, Tennessee. And then um, she was like, oh no, Cleveland, Ohio. And I was like, oh, it snows. So, <laughs> But uh, long story short, that's, you know, the program and, um, um, that was introduced to me uh, was the Greater Area of National Needs, the GAN Fellowship, in which I was awarded and um, pursued my PhD. And I think that story is very familiar. I know that's my story also, is that I ended up in my PhD program because of a faculty saying, no, you're going to get your PhD. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not. And he said, yes, you are. And we went back and forth on the no's and the yeses for a while. And, it, and he literally handheld and walked me through. And, 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 that's, and I attribute to Dr. Larry Terry from Cleveland State University to being the only reason that I have a PhD because I was dead set on no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and I say that because I think that is the experience for many black students is that they have someone who says, this is what you're gonna do and then we say, okay, well, I guess it's not unreasonable. I can do it. But in that, that also led to a second part of your story as to why you're still here at Case Western Reserve. Oh, and yeah. so, yeah, and so we know that you've had some great mentorship um, with the institution as well as you serving as a great mentor for students. And so share with, with everyone one of the main reasons that you are still a part of Case Western Reserve University. Oh, yes. Two people come to mind. So um, when I arrived at uh, Case Western Reserve University, Dr. Faye Gary um, was my mentor and dissertation, dissertation chair. And so um, um, I had the privilege of um, learning a lot um, from her, um, as well as um, Dr. Gary socializing me into a community of just um, prominent and well-renowned scholars. Um, you know, this extended out to the University of Virgin Islands, um, to across the country. So I was fortunate to have one of those um, uh, mentor groups that, you know, um, believed in me. And then, you know, um, after I completed my PhD, um, at the time, uh, Mae Weichel was the dean of Case Western Reserve University. And uh, she introduced me to Dr. Jackson Wright. Um, and I was able to um, began working with the systolic blood pressure trial. And so I had um, Dr. Wright as uh, a great mentor to um, navigate me through um, a multi-site um, clinical trial, as well as um, taking the time to uh, invest in my professional development. So we would set up weekly meetings and, okay, what are you going to do? And I'm looking like, what do you, what do you mean? What am I going to do? And um, so just investing um, in my development, um, which helped propel my career um, tremendously and just um, exposing me to um, different things at a national level, 
um, you know, um, sitting at the table at some time, you know, we were, you know, one of two people of color in a room of a hundred and, you know, just having that, you know, like, wow, I'm at the table moment and um, contributing um, in a leadership role. So I just, you know, I think um, people are placed in your life for a reason. And if one door closes, um, another door will open, um, be patient. And um, I think that has happened thus far for me. And um, I'm just very fortunate. Yep. And I, and I wanted you to share that because I think it's very important. And especially when we're talking about our faculty on campus and the highlight is just um, how you're still here because of the support system and, 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 and when we talk about retention efforts, it's creating that community that existed um, and, and support system for you. I know that you and I have talked about uh, the, the data and the statistics and the number of women, specifically when we talk about Black women when it comes to being PhD students, uh, when it comes to the field of nursing. And I think statistically only 2% of faculty are Black women. What do you think some of the challenges are for Black women in general when it comes to higher education and working um, within, certain, within certain disciplines? Well, I think it is um, the lack of mentorship is probably number one. The lack of not being able or socialized into large networks um, to build um, their program of research. And I think that really um, hinders them from progressing and they may feel, they may feel isolated, um, despaired, and it, it may typically end in not completing uh, a PhD or for that matter, um, matriculating through academic ranks. Um, as, as part of where, where, where would you like to see, or what would you like to see your role when it comes to mentoring, working, encouraging um, additional Black women when we talk about especially students and um, PhDs? Um, as a wise person told me, uh, pay it forward. <laughs> so I do intend to do that. I do do that currently. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that it will change um, eventually the numbers and starting to see more people that look like me um, uh, in the field, not just nursing, but, you know, on an academic um, level, academia level. Yes, and I think it's the necessity that we have because there needs to be uh, more. And I know, you know, we're all working to change those, change the numbers and moving forward. Um, I do have um, a, a statement. I was trying to read it to see if there was a statement or <laughs> a, a question in the chat, but from Jackson Wright, I was winding down my career and needed help. I think that all realized that I was more the beneficiary of the talents of Dr. Steele. She went quickly to a seat on the executive committee of that large <laughs> multi-center sprint trial and amassed a huge publication portfolio. So <laughs> there was a little credit given back to you on, on, on the work. And I think someone said earlier too, that when we talk about this on the, um, in the chat, uh, when mentors become sponsors, is transformative. And I, and I think that's the difference is that, you know, there was a mentorship role, but then it became that sponsor role that, and in that sponsorship role, um, like Jackson Wright, Dr. Faye Geary, they knew that you possessed the talents and the skills to move forward. And they were just putting you in the space to say, now, hey, you move forward and you go. <laughs> um, we, we've talked about your research and we've talked about, you know, in the field of nursing, um, and, and, I, and I shared earlier, especially when I think about um, of, of Dion, Dion Williams, who referred me to you and, and how great she's done under your guidance as, as a student. And now in Atlanta, you know, moving forward with her PhD, soon to be a graduate. And um, in that, what advice would you offer 
to students who are thinking about pursuing a nursing degree? I would say go for it. Um, and I would also um, encourage, and encourage them to seek out support early, utilize me if they have to, um, and, and don't be afraid. Um, put yourself out there and um, ask for help early. There's nothing wrong with asking for help. And I think a lot of times our students of um, color are fearful to ask for help. You know, and it may be that their confidence level is low and they do not want to ask for help. And I think we have to alleviate that stigma that it is okay to ask for help and that you don't have to go at this alone. There is support. Yeah, definitely. And I think you said, you said it great, is that understanding that there is support and there are people that want to assist and want to help. Um, you may run into that one or two who you're questioning do you want me here? But there are a number of others that are there to help. If there are any questions for Dr. Steele, we do ask that you put those in the chat and we will, um, we will ask of those questions. What I will ask is, with you being in Cleveland, you've been here for a while. Yes. And so <laughs> what is it that you like to do in Cleveland? Ah, oh, let's see. So I have to entertain my eight-year-old daughter and my four-year-old son. So... Um, I tour Cleveland like I do not live here with them. Um, um, when I wind down with my husband, we are sports fans. So we do a lot of um, uh, sports activity pre-COVID. But uh, also uh, my husband is an engineer. So um, we're not one of these famous people that do fix up stuff on whatever these HD TVs are. But um, we, we do try. So but you know, I'll be more or less the moderator and he does all the work, but I stand in the background. But we do do projects of that nature. <laughs> so <laughs> we do a lot of um, uh, house projects. So every, seems like every, I don't know, around the winter months, we start a project. So, um, but I've, I've utilized it to my advantage. I've gotten, you know, custom shoe closets and, uh, you know, um, uh, custom cabinets uh, around the fireplace. So he's, he's handy. I got to keep him. But, uh... <laughs> so now you all, and so you've done, you and your husband have done those projects together? Yes. That, did, you, did you do what projects did you do during COVID? Ah, uh, so COVID, uh, my husband has started, um, you know, the space under the stairs. Mm -hmm. He wants to turn into like a storage space. So he's cut out all the walls um, under the store. So that's the project we're working on. Now, previous to that, we were doing a, a, a custom shoe closet. So, Wow. I may have to hire y'all. He <laughs> comes in when you can stand behind. <laughs> um, and I'll leave. <laughs> yeah. Also doing uh, COVID. My, uh, so I have um, five sisters. One is my twin. And uh, we have cook off so we like to cook um, and um, compare who has the best looking food. Not that it tastes good, but that it look which one looks the best. So uh, we do that. Um, and my husband tries to cook too. So, so with you enjoying cooking, what's the what? What do you like to cook? Ah, uh, some dishes. Let's see. Um, oxtails. Um, You're doing real cooking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're taking us some soul food cooking. <laughs> yes, uh, soul food, uh, oxtails, um, you know, fish. Uh, I think the last dish my sister and I, um, we, um, we cooked um, some lamb stew and uh, I think she cooked um, plantains and something with it so um, my mother's from the island and uh, you know she she is the better cook I just won't tell her that um, <laughs> she 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 captures it well so I pretend to cook though but it's eatable so that's all that matters <laughs> right that's all that matters is that everyone's still alive after your cooking I do have a couple questions from the chat that I want to get in and the one is because there's a shortage of black faculty how do you balance the demands of family research, teaching and service, given the tax minority faculty often pay 
if the effort to in the effort to give back? That is a that is a great question. I have found the balance. Um, initially, uh, when I started in 2017, I did not know how to say no. And it became very, very burdensome. But now I have no qualms with saying no and just really prioritizing what I can handle. And I think that has helped shape um, how my productivity um, has turned out in terms of my research. So I limit myself to a certain amount of committees um, and um, what I engage in, you know, because time is energy and, and you can't get it back, you know, once you um, decide to take on all of these tests. So I really choose wisely what I say yes to. Um, that makes sense. I heard, um, I, I was listening to some earlier today and it was talking about being able to say no and, and knowing that, uh, and especially when we're talking about, you know, self-care and, and taking care of ourselves specifically as black women is that learning to say no and choosing wisely when you say yes. Um, and I joke and I always say no is a complete sentence. I, <laughs> yes. give, I don't have to give <laughs> justification to anything. No is a complete sentence. <laughs> And so kind of to close us out this evening, I will ask this last question that actually is a great question that came in from the chat. And it is, what do you hope the lasting impact of your work will be? Um, great question. I, I hope the lasting impact of my work will, in fact, improve cardiovascular health in minorities. Um, and that I'm able to uh, serve as, um, a, you know, a legacy of um, helping um, other students that look like me and others of color, you know, achieve, you know, these goals of um, higher degrees or more or less undergrad degrees as well. So, yeah. And that's and it's, it's a great goal and a la and a lasting impact. And I say, you know, the work that you have done and the work that you will continue to do, I know that it is going to uh, make a difference within not only the institution of Case Western Reserve but also within the um, Black community. So we thank you um, for your work and your commitment to Case Western Reserve University, and we thank you for staying with us. And I told you that before. Hey, we're going to make sure you stay and not go anywhere because you know how people like to poach our Black people and take y'all away. We're not letting you go. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I thank you, Dr. Steele, for being with us this evening and sharing your story um, and letting us get to know you and not only just your research, but get to know you um, and, and the things that you like to do and the things that you like to share in and with. And um, I thank uh, the African and African-American Studies minor for being a sponsor of the Office of Inclusion, Diversity, and Equal Opportunity and the African American Alumni Association. And I will turn the program back over to uh, Vera or Crystal for final remarks. And I think they have dates for our next Faculty of Profile Excellence. So I, again, thank you, Dr. Steele. And thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Steele. Um, what you've said has been very interesting to me. I lost a dad to a heart attack and a mom to a stroke. And I have a husband who's diabetic. So that was my question, what comes first? Because they all seem to have started um, with something and I don't know what, all I know is um, this pre-diabetic and pre-high uh, blood pressure, a lot of African-Americans were told that back in the day, like my mom and dad, and they were not on medication. So. I'm glad for your work. I enjoyed your presentation and I know all of our guests did tonight. And we wanna thank you, Dr. Steele, for everything that you are doing and will be doing in the future to help uh, alleviate some of these um, um, problems that we are still having with cardiovascular uh, disease. So we thank you for that. We thank um, Dr. Burton and um, everyone for putting all of this together through the Office of Inclusion and Diversity. Our next profile of inclusive excellence with the College of Arts and Science, Professor Dr. Emmett Jolly uh, will be on April 29th. That's April 29th, 2021. So mark your calendars for that and look for the emails. 
Also the African American Alumni Association on Thursday, April 8th, we'll have Afro Beats. Um, that's time for self-care. Uh, we did them back in the fall and everybody really enjoyed them. So join us for this dance fitness workshop. I look to see you there, Heather. Um, it will help us, you know, get rid of some of the stress, uh, a real fun one. And it will be led by Kristen Minich. Um, M-I-N-T-A-H, I can't pronounce it. But anyway, a fine young man. Uh, this event is sure to get the heart pumping and it's tons of fun. Uh, for more information about the African-American Alumni Association at Case, um, go to case.edu alum and follow us on Facebook, Case Western Reserve University, African-American Alumni Association, or you can search us at CWRU AAAA alumni. So we thank you and we thank you, Crystal, for everything. So thank you everyone and have a great evening. <laughs>